So this, uh, this talk is the um, outcome of a mix of uh, uh, some work I've uh, been doing with my uh, Laconian group here in Berlin and um, the spirit of our times, which is a, an excellent mix, I think, for the uh, entertaining. So I hope you bear with me uh, today. And we're going to talk a bit about identification in Lacan and Freud. So, it was already in the 1950s that Jacques Lacan had warned us of the politics of psychoanalysis. More than anything, he had warned us of the trending waves on which certain individuals on the other side of the Atlantic dangerously attempted to adjust psychoanalysis to the currents of general psychology. Lacan was talking about the Anglo-American school of ego psychology that had seemingly lost its popularity today, but still the backlash of its conceptual impropriety is only starting to be felt. Rightly defined as a school, its pedagogical aim was the adaptation of spontaneous subjects to a reality, and by doing so, imposing a regiment that is directed by the leader's strong ego in terms of the so-called analytical situation. Is it surprising then that these politics of the ego have disseminated into the domain of general politics? And indeed, even in the 21st century, we are still obsessed with strong egos, electing stronger and stronger ones to lead us towards what the Americans uh, quite viciously call happiness. But as Lacan noted countless times, the ego is strong enough. And as we see now in the domain of politics, it is strong enough to systematically foreclose our social institutions, as well as disavow the democratic mannerisms that enabled us to trust those other politicians who have so far supplied us with the reassuring repetition of the same. It seems that, after all, the prototypes of these strong egos, nourished by the trendy liberators of psychoanalysis, turned out to be the boogeymen of our Western liberal democracies, a nightmare that has now so delicately been materialized in the new and popular TV show Years and Years. In the Berlin coffee shops, we are regularly appalled. How can these racist, misogynistic narcissists gain the trust and support of their voters? How can an American woman vote for a man calling to grab women by the pussy? How can one elect these authoritarians who do, not but, who do nothing but betray the interests of their electoral base, who promote nothing more than the most carnal and obscene at the price of all that is living? We protest the irrationality of such choices and tag them under the term populism, a phenomenon reserved to the contemporary era of post-truth, an era where the anonymous votes of the masses are conducted by collective economies of effective identification, where scientific intellectual scrutiny has become dull and the numbers useless beyond garnishing straightforward rewarding messages. Make Germany great one more time. Nevertheless, one must remember that in psychoanalysis, truth is intimately connected with deception, which is inscribed in the very text of truth. So what exactly is the role of truth and deception in populist politics? Many forget that Plato had argued that democracy is the second worst form of political regime after tyranny. The democratic mass, consumed with unnecessary desires, can guess on average the right amount of peanuts in a, gla in a glass jar, but in relation to the good life is easily swayed by fleeting trends and a pretty face. This is the root of the democratic fallacy, which simply states that in order to democratically elect a benevolent and educated leader, the democratic people have to be benevolent and educated. In order to be benevolent and educated, a benevolent and educated leader must be elected and educate the people in the first place. 
be that as it may, I would like to suggest a few, a few crucial points today that would hopefully be a bit subversive in our understanding of our contemporary democracies. So the first point, uh, which can be easily exhausted right now, is that democracy has always been essentially populist. In other words, there is no such thing as a non-populist democracy, as democracy is inherently based on the argumentum ad populum, on the false notion that the majority's wisdom would necessarily and mostly have a close relationship with a truth. The notion of a scientific and intellectual democracy is reserved to the work of parliamentarians and bureaucrats and not to the democratic masses. The first are more akin to an aristocracy than to direct democracy. On the other hand, and this is my second point, as Ernesto Laclau puts it, populism is not inherently bad. History clearly demonstrates that some populist movements have done great things for humanity, uh, progressing us politically, emancipating minorities, providing us with more rights, ending wars, and creating progressive social and economic institutions. So if democracy is essentially populist and populism is not inherently bad, how then can we fine tune our democracies to be more resilient to the destructive face of populism? This question warrants my third point today, which will be developed in the course of this talk. Uh, briefly put, I argue this, uh, one that what we define as populism in our contemporary democracies can be better understood through the scope of Freud and Lacan's model of libidinal identification. More specifically, that populism can be associated with what Lacan defines as the imaginary form of identification. This point has been briefly presented by Francisco Panizza, and today I will mostly deepen its psychoanalytical roots. Based on this point, I will argue that progressive politics should not focus on offering more viable leaders to capture the imaginary identification of voters, but it is the symbolic position on which imaginary identification hinges that should be the object that progressive politics aims to change. So we start clarifying some concepts. According to Freud in his paper on group psychology, identification is the earliest expression of an emotional tie with another person. This expression emerges in the initial stages of the Oedipus complex and entails an ambivalent mix of hostility and tenderness felt towards the mother and the father. Freud adds that it is this unique form of libidinal identification that shapes the confines of the psyche, but also materializes on the level of civilization with the mass, uh, when the masses adopt a path marked by a single and idealized trait or person. Lacan argue, agrees with Freud that identif identification is a process whereby one subject adopts as his own one or more attributes of another, but focuses on its constitutive function in all manners that have to do with the formation of the ego. He complexified Freud's notion by distinguishing between two forms of constitutive identification, imaginary identification having to do with what Freud called the ideal ego, ideal ich, and symbolic identification having to do with the ego ideal, ich ideal. Briefly put, the first takes part in the construction of a more prototypical modality of the ego, having to do with the body image. The second takes part in intertwining the ego with the symbolic norms and ideals provided by culture. So we progress to imaginary identification. So the notion of imaginary identification is developed in Lacan's early account of the mirror stage, already in 1949. Lacan defines identification in the mirror stage as a process that transitions the infant from a helpless state of fragmented corporeality, 
associated with motor impotence and nursling dependence, to a state of organized motor functioning. This transition hinges on the identification with a specular image that represents the unity of the body. As I brought here in the example there. Uh, Lacan illustrates a scene in which the infant encounters its own reflection in the mirror at a certain age between six and 18 months, assumes this image as the totalized, and assumes this image as the totalized correlate of its body. In agreement with his contemporaries in the Gestalt movement, Lacan describes this as a jubilatory aha moment in which the child identifies with the virtual Gestalt image, making this image a representative of a whole that is more than its parts. At this moment of jubilation, the virtual Gestalt image is invested with libido and thus gains a superior status amongst the objects in the psyche. Lacan, Lacan associates the imaginary identification with the Gestalt image with Freud's accounts of the infant's identification with the ideal ego. The ideal ego is a psychic construct that embodies one prototypical aspect of the ego, mostly having to do with the ideal of perfection that the ego strives to emulate on the backdrop of the chaotic and fragmented reality of the infant's body. Nevertheless, Lacan emphasizes that the identification with the ideal ego is essentially deceptive. That is, for firstly, the subject does not truly find itself in the specular image, as it is other. The gaze in the mirror is dead. And secondly, even after the identification with the ideal ego, the body remains fragmented never making the perfect and idealized spherical ego more than an imaginary correlate. And indeed, isn't the identification with the image of the populist leader carried out with a similar elated jubilation? One does not need to venture far into history in order to see how excited and invested are Bolsonaro's followers in Brazil. His image offered on the backdrop of empty slogans that come to express an idealized trait he associates with. Similarly, how many voters adore Putin because he is strong and Trump because he says what he thinks? All of these are single traits attributed to the leader which express the ideal one finds it preferable to identify with, a way in which one unconsciously desires to see oneself disregarding the symbolic position on which it is based. And for the sake of remaining uh, relevant uh, and contemporary, it is interesting to note that in the state of Israel, which had an election just recently, uh, the Likud party, the ruling party, has not provided any official manifesto or declaration of interest in the last three elections. So practically no one knows what they stand for because officially they refuse to declare it. Nevertheless, Netanyahu keeps being elected into office, which is an interesting phenomenon. On another note, can we not identify the deceptive, deceptive notion of unity these populist leaders provide their voter with? A unity that is associated with the image of the leader commonly conditioned by a preceding, fragmented, and alienated heterogeneous society. It is only on the backdrop of this fragmentation that an exclusive and aggressive ideology can be offered in the aim of dislodging a problematic other from the inside, an other that contrasts an image of an idealized, <coughs> homogenous, and functioning good old social body. Now, Lacan explicitly associates the inherent aggressiveness in imaginary identification with his notion of frustration. According to Lacan, a child is born into the world already accompanied by a lack of satisfaction. There is always something in the world that is not for him or her, that is taken away or was never there in the first place. The transition from the hypothesized state of total satisfaction <laughs> 
to a state which is, uh, which is structurally lacking brings about the dialectics of frustration in the Oedipus complex. Faced with this impasse, the child begins to wonder, what does mother desire beyond the total satisfaction of my own needs? In response, the child attempts to fill this lack with imaginary objects associated with her desire. By doing so, the child enters into an imaginary narcissistic relationship with these objects, which are the correlate of his lack. This child ident the child identifies with a series of images representing these idealized objects, the same objects which are the root of its own frustration. The idealized prototypical ego, the ideal ego, is constructed on the basis of these images that, when brought together, take the form of a demontage of the absolute object, an object that constitutes the ideal of perfection that the subject structurally does not possess. <laughs> this is why the image in the mirror is both a target of one's love but also an output for one's most obscene and carnal aggressive urges and fantasies. It is a place where both find their output. This ideal of perfection and the ambivalent love-hate relationship with it have crucial structuring effects on the subject as it serves as a model for future imag imaginary projections, fantasies, and desires. Accordingly, we can see in one's adult life a continuous engagement in imaginary relationships with other human beings, which is based on the first series of acquired images in the mirror stage. Quite similarly, populism is rooted in a genuine sense of frustration. Just like the relationship between the subject and the image, civilization is in a constant state of discontent. Something prevents society from achieving total satisfaction. There is always something else, someone else, which takes this satisfaction from me. It is the identification with the, pop with the populist idealized absolute object of total satisfaction, which provides an output for the inherent aggressiveness rooted in society's content, constant state of discontent, providing a legitimate output for one's most obscene and carnal aggressive tendencies directed at the other. So in summary, we can say that the state of elated jubilation, the structural alienation that promotes a deceptive sense of unity, the aggressive relation to the other, the total reliance on the idealized traits of the leader, and the frustration rooted in a lack of satisfaction, all bring me to progress the hypothesis that populism can be associated in the political domain it can be assessed, sorry, in the political domain using the coordinates Lacan offers for imaginary identification. In other words, that the success of populist leaders hinges on this unique psychic process that shapes our imaginary relationships with other human beings as adults. Now, different people have different ideals. That's a fact. For instance, uh, some people view the patriotic soldier as the manifestation of a universal good, while others see the peace-seeking pacifist as taking that same position. Some will define the patriotic soldier as a cruel, oppressive figure which signifies self-destruction and despair, while others will define the pacifist as the personification of blind and childish idealism. There are different types of ideals which entail different types of standpoints or perspectives from which to be judged as ideals. The critical point, which cannot be ignored, is that every imaginary ideal identification is always preliminary rooted in a symbolic perspective from which it is perceived. Lacan calls the identification with the perspective that shapes and defines our imaginary form of identification symbolic identification. And correspondingly, Jacques Alain Miller calls the first one constitutive and the second one constituted identification. Now, as Zizek states it quite simply and succinctly as, as usual, if imaginary identification is an identification with an ideal of the ego, 
then symbolic identification is the identification with the position from which this ego is perceived as an ideal. Yeah? Uh, the perspective from which we see ourselves as loved or as deserving love. And this is a formula, that really exact formula from Zizek. In contrast to imaginary identification, it is not an identification with an absolute object representing total satisfaction. It is an identification with the position from which a measured form of satisfaction becomes possible. In the scope of the Oedipus complex, this position is termed by Freud the ego ideal. It is the place from which the father's authority provides a symbolic substitute for the impossibility of total satisfaction, put in place of the frustratingly inadequate imaginary absolute object. A place from which the symbolic lack of the imaginary object can be inscribed and put the demand for total satisfaction at rest, finally. Lacan associates symbolic identification with the subject's very entry into the law. This is the symbolic law which organizes intersubjective relationships as well as the functioning of language as a mediator and organizer of the body's fragmented libido. According to Lacan, by entering the symbolic domain of the law, the aggressive and narcissistic state of imaginary identification is alleviated as it provides the imaginary demand for total satisfaction with a form that can be worked with. In consequence, it allows the subject to recognize and relate to the other through speech, and thus to partially transcend the imaginary state of aggressiveness and mutual destruction. Now, it seems that progressives in the democratic world today fail to acknowledge the distinction between these two forms of identification. They see the success of the political, of the populist right, and attempt to follow its trends by offering a better and shinier proponent to idealize, trying to beat the populace at their own game. But this is quite an impossible feat, for the populist right will always have an advantage with everything that has to do with imaginary identification for they naturally draw their objects of identification from the very core of our instinctual being. That is, from the aggressive, narcissistic relationship to the ideal ego. This relationship is fundamentally conditioned by images of emasculation, mutilation, dismemberment, evisceration, devouring, and bursting open of the body. In short, what Lacan had grouped together under the heading of the imagos of the fragmented body. All of these materialize in an excessive mode of enjoyment that might only find its true opponent in ecstatic love. On the other hand, progressive values are based on the moderation and egalitarian distribution of enjoyment. How could they be the unbridled enjoyment propagated by the obscene leaders of the populist right? It is to drive a hard bargain when offering the ideal administrator of moderation and self-restraint, and here Merkel might be the last of our kind, for the price of the foreman of unbridled jouissance. Clearly, on this level of identification, it is an unfair game and those playing loosely with the rules and using dirty tricks will most probably win. But progressives do have one fundamental point of strength. While the populist right depends on a position of imaginary identification that denies its symbolic roots, progressive politics is inherently rooted in the promotion of the social symbolic. This would be an identification with the way a specific ideology organizes enjoyment, not so much offering a, the specific object that is to be enjoyed, than offering the perspective from which an object is viewed as enjoyable. Accordingly, instead of attempting to supply better objects for imaginary identification, I suggest that progressives should aim to clearly signify a symbolic position 
that would provide the political form through which the aggressive and narcissistic state of imaginary identification could be alleviated. Now, this point was not taken into account by the American Democratic Party and its notorious delegate, Hillary Clinton, in the 2016 presidential elections. Uh, I always also give an example from uh, the Israeli elections of 2000 with Ariel Sharon, same case, um, similar at least. They have failed to supply the political domain with a symbolic position from which a different form of identification could take place but we're only relying on Clinton being a better object of imaginary identification. Sticking to similar tactics may be the cause of the state of stagnation in our political dynamism, a stagnation that results in the, in the repetitive re-election of charismatic, easy to relate to figures, sometimes figures like Barack Obama, which is identifiable thanks to his very elegant and admirable conduct, and other times like the vulgar Trump, but because imaginary identification relies on its symbolic designation, I suggest that we can hope to see real change in political conduct only when progressives start to address the symbolic grounds that enables this identification to thrive in the first place and provide their sufficient elaboration as a fruitful ground for social growth and not only individual enjoyment. This perspective is starting to strike root with some of today's American candidates who progress a return to a discussion of an inclusive social agenda based on a universal ethics of responsibility and change. A change of strategy that would hopefully be fruitful and challenge the hegemonic neoliberal perspective. Okay. Um, we'll get to that in a second. So this brings me to my last point, uh, which is more a question, uh, is returning to the symbolic enough? Some scholars argue that our current political symbolic has been exhausted, that it was productive for some centuries, but now it has been corrupted up to a level where it does not function anymore. By, by saying so, they claim that the symbolic position from which politics produces its ideals had played its course and now only manifests as an impasse that culminates in a regression to the level of imaginary identification. If this is true, relying on symbolic identification will not be sufficient pro for progressive politics. In this case, a new form of identification entailing an invention of a new symbolic position will have to take place. Now, in the later years of his teaching, Lacan did discuss a third form of identification. He named identification with the symptom. This notion came to fruition in his 23rd seminar on James Joyce. In this seminar, the case of Joyce provides Lacan with an example for an invention of a new way in which language organizes enjoyment beyond the father's authority established in the Oedipus complex. Lacan basically argues that because Joyce's symbolic identification is defective due to his psychosis, he goes on to supplement this identification, not by regressing to the level of the imaginary, which uh, that's how Lacan describes some psychotic solutions, but through his particular way of writing. By doing so, Joyce manages to produce a partially individualized symbolic law, which, which originated in an identification with what Lacan called the Santon. In other words, due to, di to his rejection of the symbolic, Joyce invents his own Santon and remains between neurosis and psychosis. This Santon is an individualized and anti-ideological invention that carries universal value in the field of art. Now, following Lacan's seminars on Joyce, the Lacanian clinic has opened up a new direction to the treatment, through which the neurotic can also transform his symptom into a Santon. This is done through a separation from the symbolic 
and the reinscription of a new individualized master signifier. Be that as it may, the question remains open. Can the end of analysis also include the identification with a truly original master signifier that enables a new way of desiring or a new way through which enjoyment is organized? If so, what would be the political implications of such identification? On the cultural level, this form of identification would still entail the return to the symbolic. Just like Lacan returned to Freud in order to reinvent psychoanalysis, it would entail a return to the symbolic in order to reorient the political real. Concentrating on the promotion of a new symbolic law through a political struggle aiming to establish its authority. Now, without venturing into its conceptual development, I would like to suggest today that the distinction of such a form of identification, and here I'm a bit biased, uh, should be developed on the basis of Alain Badiou's theory of subjectivation presented in his book, Logics of Worlds. Briefly presented as food for thought or a provocation for action, I provide three distinct vicissitudes of identification on the basis of the incorporation of this model in Lacan's account of identification pre presented so far. A regressive imaginary identification, a constitutive sym symptomic identification, and a, sorry, and a, re a symbolic identification which is uh, situated here in the place of repetition. These might comply with Badiou's three subjective positions in the political situation, the obscure, reactionary, and revolutionary. By assessing identif identificatory investment on the basis of, this, of these vicissitudes, we might be able to direct ourselves to find a new way through which politics organizes enjoyment. Not only a new master, as La Lacan contested in his 17th seminar, but new vicissitudes for our libidinal economies. Thanks. <laughs>